What's up, guys? Welcome back to the MMA meeting. Let's talk the Weasel Podcast, where we talk all things MMA. Hope you guys have an amazing one, man. I've been checking out some debates in terms of like the global population collapse and stuff. I'm always like interested in debates, regardless of what it is about, and kind of just to get more educated on these certain topics. But so that last fight night card, it started off pretty good, a lot of great finishes, but then it ended up being quite boring. I would give the card. Maybe like a 5 out of 10. Rosa Strike and Gaziev was your typical heavyweight fight. Gaziev started off pretty strong. Rosa Strike kept a consistent pace, and Gaziev eventually gassed. I think they're throwing these prospects into main events a little too quickly. Gaziev was not ready for Rosenstrike. I actually picked Rosenstrike to win the fight, and I was quite confident in that. Even though Gaziev is a heavyweight, he doesn't necessarily have a lot of snap with his punches. And I just did not see him lasting with Rosenstrike for 5 rounds. So Gaziev quit because he couldn't see... Is that the reason? I was so confused on why Gaziev quit. It just goes to show you that the heavyweight division is just not on par with the others. So decent win for Rosenstrike. For his next fight, I think you should go up against Marcos Rogero de Lima. And then for the co-main event, Vitor Petrino defeats Tyson Pedro by a decision. I expect this fight to be a lot more action-packed, but Petrino fought intelligently. He fought a lot more composed than I thought he was capable of doing. He was landing pretty good kicks, waiting on Tyson Pedro to come forward, and ultimately just a decent performance. Not the most exciting, but definitely a good showcase of Petrino's maturity in the sport. And then Pedro retired with a 10-5 record, and he said the reason he's retiring is because he's got other aspirations in life he has other paths he wants to go down other things he's more interested in happens and you know he's got a family and stuff completely understandable I wish Tyson Pedro all the best he has some really good finishes throughout his career incredibly talented fighter his first two UFC wins are against Khalil Roundtree and Paul Craig both of those finished in the first round and still to this day those are his two best wins of his entire career and he also gave us one of the coolest pulse fight celebrations when he Defeated Anton Tercali. Man, I'm going to miss Tyson Pedro. He was pretty cool. But I wish him the best whatever avenue he wants to take. And in the post-fight press conference, Tyson Pedro was talking about how he just doesn't make enough money. He says he has to do other things. And it's quite crazy. A guy who used to be ranked at one point of his career, a guy who's been around for years, is struggling financially due to his pay. Now, of course, he was out for a pretty long time with injuries and stuff. But a fighter at that level, I believe they all should get paid a lot more. I've talked about this for years. I think once you get to this organization, it should be regarded as the top organization in the world, and those fighters should get paid more than everybody else. But it looks like if you're a lower-level fighter in the UFC, you might make more money in the other organizations like PFL, Bellator, One. Like, look at Impa Kazanage, a guy who couldn't even make it into the top 15 in the UFC, made over a million dollars in the PFL. And then you got guys like Donald Cerrone doubling down on the fact that he couldn't get paid more to fight Conor McGregor. That's his pay, right? 200000 or whatever he said. It's just laughable. I don't know who told him he couldn't get paid more. Because, man, he fooled Donald Trump to actually believe that he couldn't negotiate for more pay. But what could have happened was, if Cowboy did ask for more pay, they could have went to someone else. So that's where a big issue in fighter pay is. It's that the fighters will take up each other's spots if they go to negotiate for pay. And this was shown when Derek Lewis and Cyril Gunn accepted to fight each other for the interim belt for a fraction of the pay that Jones and Ngannou were asking for, and they headlined that card instead. That's a big reason why I don't talk that much about fighter pay anymore, is because no matter how many times we complain about it or we're trying to get the fighters back, they shoot themselves or they shoot the other fighter in the foot and after that win I think Vitor Petrino deserves a top 15 opponent and he called out Anthony Smith which it looks like Smith's down so I guess we got a fight I was kind of surprised that he would be willing to accept the fight against a guy who's outside the top 15 but I guess Anthony Smith wants all that smoke he even said that Vitor Petrino has nothing for him so that's gonna be a bit interesting if I was Anthony I wouldn't be too sure about that Mohamed Mokayev defeats Alex Perez by a decision. So this was arguably Mokayev's toughest fight in his career, or at least it was supposed to be. I've known about him ever since he was an amateur fighter. I was very high on him even back then. This was not a great performance. Now, he was going up against a higher ranked opponent. And he is still only 23 years old with a lot of growing room for his future. But seeing him playing the game like that, man, he was playing with the grounded rules. I don't like seeing that sort of stuff. And he wasn't confident at all in his striking, even though he looked pretty good. He had a good jab. He had some good stepping uppercuts. Decent kicks as well. His defense not as great as his offense overall. He was leaning back with his hands down and stuff when he was up against the fence. But man, it would be awesome to see him have more confidence in his striking and mix up the wrestling, kind of how Umar did. Like, the way that Umar performed, that's why I expected Adam Okayev as well. Mix up the boxing with the wrestling seamlessly. Not... 
I'm going to strike and then I'm going to drop to my knees. It's like, what's going on here? Muhammad Mokaev was saying that he was compromised coming into this fight. In fact, that's like the first thing he said in the in the interview. He actually was just mentioning how he wasn't 100%. But honestly, not an impressive performance from him. I think after this fight, 125 is a bit of a mess. Because there is no rightful number one contender to fight Pantoja. And also, after looking at this fight, nobody beats Pantoja until Father Time does. Now, you could give a title shot to Amir Abazi, but will he be ready for May? Because that's when Pantoja wants to fight. If he's not ready for May, I guess you do Pantoja versus Roy Vell again. But Roy Vell just lost to him a few months ago. You can't give him Moreno. You can't give him Kai Kawa France. You can't give him Matthias Nicolau. Can you give him Manel Kep? This is how I think the 125 should be. I think Emil Abazi, if he is ready, you give him the title shot against Pantoja. And then you do Mohamed Mokai versus Brandon Roy Vell for the number one contender fight. Then I'll do Manel Kep versus Kai Kawa France. That fight needs to happen. And I guess you do Brendan Moreno versus Henry Cejudo. Because Cejudo's saying that he wants to fight him. And as for Alex Perez. So Perez is on a three-fight law streak. I think he should get Matias Nikolaou next. Umar Nurmagomedov defeats Beksat Almakan by a decision. 30-27 on all scorecards. That first round is really tricky to score. Because Umar got knocked down and hurt pretty badly. But then he dominated like every part of that fight after it and got Bex out in some really bad positions on the ground. I don't know how to score that. It's kind of strange. I think you should give it to Bex out because he came closer to finishing the fight. That's kind of how I see it. But regardless, Umar clearly won this fight and his wrestling looked really good. Bex out's takedown defense is not too great though. He fell to those single legs a bit too easily. Like there was barely any resistance against him. And even when Umar was passing into full mount, Baxot didn't really have much for him there either. But that guy can swing. He throws that right hand like he's pitching a fastball. Baxot's gotta have a Mongolian right arm. I mean, Genghis Khan is definitely proud of this guy. The speed at which he throws that punch is crazy. And he's gonna be a problem for a bunch of these bantamweights, man. Because if he cracks anybody with that shot, they're gonna go down. Besides, like, maybe Cheeto or something. And Baxot's pretty young, you know, 26 years old. He's got a lot of groin room. And it just goes to show you bantamweight just keeps getting better, man. This weight class is just so good, man. But what should you do for Umar next? Well, I think regardless, they're going to give him Corey Sanhagen most likely. I would like to see a fight Davis at Vigoredo. If he is fighting Corey, that should be a pretty interesting fight. And as for Bexah, there's a lot of opponents they could give him. You can't really go wrong with anybody outside the top 15. And a lot of fans have been talking about the whole ground and knee thing again. You know, I brought this up years ago that ground and knee should come back. Back then, people thought I was crazy and I was a savage for even mentioning that ground and knees and soccer kicks should be allowed. But now it seems like everybody is on board with it. But they seem to think that, for example, like all these wrestlers will get destroyed because of it. And that's a big reason as to why... They want the ground and knees back, but they're confusing themselves. Ground and knees can definitely help the fighters that are defending takedowns, but it could also greatly help the wrestlers too. Like Mohamed Mokayev, yeah, ground and knees would have definitely hurt him in that fight. He was dropping into positions to get kneed on the ground. But on the other hand, Umar Nurmagomedov would have used the ground and knees. He would not be in the same positions as Mokayev was. He secured every single takedown, and whenever he got into side control, he would have been able to rain knees down on Bexot. The ground and knees go both ways. It's a technique that a fighter can use when he's sprawling on a takedown, but it's also a technique that a wrestler can use when he's taking the opponent down and getting to side control or north-south. And the north-south position is going to be a lot more dominant in the game, whereas right now it's barely used. Steve Erzeg knocking out Matt Schnell with the 1-2-3, bing, 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 puts him down. Matt Schnell just doesn't have any defense. He doesn't pick his hands up, he doesn't move his head, and he barely moves his feet. It'd be so scary if we ever saw this guy fight John Lineker or something. And Steve Ursek is not even a knockout artist, he's a submission guy. That's a second knockout win of his career, and he continues to look really good. He's on a huge win streak, great wins in the UFC already, definitely rising to the occasion. I love that 1-2-3 through at him, man. Jab up top, right straight to the the body left hook to the head to end it beautiful combination i did miss the eric anders and jamie pickett fight i was very depressed and had to take a nap after it happened to bernardo sopai no but i had some errands to run uh, when that fight was going down that's the only thing about these cars that are in the early afternoon you know sometimes we're pretty busy during these times especially when we got families and stuff but what i will say is I did put $500 on Eric Anders. He was like my lock of the card more than anybody else actually and then i, I want to skip the next fight but i can't i gotta face it Vinicius Oliveira knocks out Bernardo Solpai with a fly knee from Brazil. That is like a knockout of the year candidate right there. And that's so heartbreaking for any Albanian. We'll eventually get one, man. 
will eventually get a prospect that comes into the sport and just does some great things. Solpai is still young. He did look pretty good in the fight, but he gassed. Didn't pace himself that well either. But I thought it was probably the best fight on the whole card as well, even before the knockout. But you got to give a lot of credit to Vinicius Oliveira for pulling that off out of nowhere like that. The part about it that hurts the most is that Solpai told him that he would knock Oliveira out cold. You'd put him to sleep, and then it just happens the other way. Solpai is going to be in those compilations, man. No way. When trash talk goes wrong. Eamon Zahabi and Javid Bashar was also a really good fight. Bashar getting the first loss of his career against Errol Hawani. Javid is a good fighter. Eamon Zahabi is also a good fighter as well. But I really like Fareed Bashar more. Fareed Bashar is incredibly well-rounded and so cerebral. Javid is technical in his own right, but the wrestling during this fight with Zahabi wasn't looking too great. Krishna Laura Duncan just using Claudio Ribeiro as a heavy bag. I mean, you see all those techniques in the first round. Hook kicks, side kicks, round kicks, spinning kicks, spinning elbows, just throwing a bunch of different stuff and all Claudio Ribeiro was doing was covering up he just put up a guard and just absorbed it all but then eventually Christian Laurie Dunk was able to get the fight to the ground and finish through ground and pound really really good performance from him man Ludovic Klein just annihilated AJ Cunningham he goes one two one left high kick right hook to the body left hook to the body throwing the right hook and left as he backed away then AJ Cunningham walked into a thrusting kick to the body that puts him down. And what I liked what Klein was doing was um, before he threw that first jab, he was kind of playing with it on the outside, trying to distract Cunningham a bit before he tightened the jab. Just clean striking from Ludovic Klein. And then what about Loik Ratzabov? Just straight Terminator mode in that third round. Eats the leg kick and just throws out a left hook and just cracks Al Salati with the right overhand for the finish. So, so pretty fun card early on. And I didn't get to talk about the fight night card a week ago. The UFC fight night card that happened last weekend was pretty interesting. I did expect the card to be better than it was, given the names that were on it. You know, with Brandon Moreno and Brandon Royval and Yara Rodriguez and Ortega. Some really good prospects throughout. It was kind of a bummer that Raul Rosas Jr. pulled out and he got sick, but I don't know why he's not fighting this weekend. I thought the car was going to play out better than it actually did, but I do think ultimately the car was pretty good. My viewpoint doesn't really get clouded by the hype of a card. I just look at the cards for what they are, you know? And at the end of the day, the card played out pretty well. There were some pretty good fights. There were some decent finishes, even though a lot of the fights on the main card went to a decision. But not all decisions are going to be boring. That seems to be a common trope amongst the fans that believe um, if the fight goes to a decision, it's mostly going to be boring. And that's not necessarily true. Like with Zell Huber and Prado, that fight was not boring at all, even though it went to a decision. What Zell Huber was able to display with his jab, pinpoint accuracy on Prado's right eye was just really good to see. And Prado's going to learn a lot from that. He's only 21 years old. He's definitely going to show up better next time and evolve his defense to not get peppered by a longer fighter's jab that way. And he's a very aggressive fighter, so he definitely needs to have some sort of head movement or an ability to catch and counter the opponent's intercepting attacks. But when we talk about that main event, Brennan Moreno versus Brennan Royval, this is one a lot of people have focused on because not only was it not what we expected, we did not expect the fight to be as lackluster as it was. It wasn't too fun to watch. It wasn't too entertaining. But above all else, Brennan Moreno just didn't fight anywhere near the same as he used to. He came out there like he was Dan Henderson, spamming overhands against a longer opponent. And the thing is, Royvel is not a new opponent for him. This is not some unfamiliar guy. He's fought Royvel before years ago. And yes, he was throwing overhands at Royvel even back then, but he had a lot better distance management against Royvel, who was also in the southpaw stance. And he landed a pretty good jab in that first fight too. He was finding them in this one later, but barely went to them. And we have to remember, Moreno back then was not evolved like he is now, or at least up to the Pantoja fight. Moreno developed such a great jab, amazing body shots, and an excellent ability to angle off for his punches to connect better than he's ever done before. And it seemed like all of that got left in the Pantoja fight. His body kicks. All of these were open on Royval. All of these. Even the jab was, considering that Royval was in the southpaw stance, is because he wasn't really picking his hands up at all times. And Moreno had a lot of clear openings to deflect the lead hand and jab up top. And the big success out of Royval was the jabs and the left kicks. And Moreno was just stuck throwing overhands. It was so weird to see. And honestly, Moreno might be washed. And I rarely ever use that term. It seems like all the wars have caught up to Moreno. The Figueredo Wars, the Pantoja Wars, those kind of fights would age any fighter. And even at 32 years old, it looks like Moreno is not the same fighter anymore. 
it's a sad reality for a lot of them, man. But for sure, we have to see how he competes in his next fight because he is being called out by Henry Cejudo. And I think that fight does make a lot of sense. It just depends if Cejudo is going to go down to 125 or if Moreno wants to try his chances up at 135 against Cejudo specifically because it looks like at this point, Moreno might never get a title shot again as long as Pantoja holds that belt. And as for Roy Val, what do you do with him? I think he should fight Amir Albazi when he makes his comeback because Albazi was supposed to fight Moreno that night. And I think Roy Val versus Albazi should be the number one contender fight if they do Mokayev this soon in May. But he does have a fight coming up, so we'll see how that goes. Brian Ortega revealed in the first round of his fight with Yair Rodriguez that the reason why he looked a bit off and he got caught and stuff was because he was too focused on his injury or him rolling his ankle during the buffer introductions, which I can understand. Like, imagine you're just jumping, you're getting ready for a very important fight in your career. You need to get this win and you roll your ankle like that. I can understand how that could distract you a bit, but I don't buy that excuse too much because he got caught pretty clean. And I don't think any version of Ortega would have gotten away from that punch. Even looking in the second and third rounds, his head movement was not really that great. And I think he could have got caught by something like that again. Like there was that point in, um, I think it was in the beginning of the third round or end of the second, where Yair caught him with another left straight and then slapped his face with a left high kick and Ortega just did not move his head at all but I don't think Ortega should get a title shot right now I think he needs another fight and the perfect fight in my opinion would be him and Mavsar Evloev I think you have that as a title eliminator in order to get the next contender for Ilya Tapuria any other notable fights on this card Manuel Torres had a really good win against Chris Duncan he walked into an overhand which I thought was going to happen to him he was going to eventually walk into some sort of punch he got rattled up by it and backed away Duncan thought he was hunting down his prey and then his life flashed before his eyes when Torres threw that high kick he was wide open for it did not put up a guard was not protecting himself and the kick went right over his head and Duncan lost balance because of it it might have grazed the top of his head by the way he was stumbling after it but man that must have been terrifying for Duncan right there and that's where everything went downhill for him you know it got into a grappling exchange Duncan was trying to take him to the ground Torres body locked him and tripped him out and then eventually dragged him to the ground yet again to get his back and submit him. A lot of people thought that Felipe Dos Santos should have lost his fight and Muhammad Naimov just obliterated Eric Silva. Absolutely annihilated him, man. So it was a decent card overall, I think. And regarding Henry Cejudo, yeah, so Cejudo's not going to retire. He has backtracked on this and has decided to keep fighting, which is a common trope for old fighters that don't know when to hang it up. And he probably should have stayed retired or if not... He should not have retired, right? It should have been one or the two. If fighters retire, they usually should stay retired unless they can negotiate their way back into a big fight so then they have a one-off, you know, and then ride right into the sunset off that, like GSP kind of did. So Huda was looking to do that, but now he's stuck fighting because he lost. And it usually happens, man, when these fighters come off a loss like this, they just have to keep going. They don't know when to really hang it up. And it worries me for Ilya Tapura if he does come back later because it's usually the second retirement that's permanent. And the thing about Cejudo is he doesn't have that much brain damage compared to some of the other fighters, you know, some of these other 37-year-old guys. But the years of wrestling and MMA has certainly damaged his body to an extent. And you saw a little bit of a, a decline in his uh, Marab Devalashvili fight. And there has been some excuses, especially from his manager Ali, who has said that Henry Cejudo could not really train well for that fight. He barely was able to train against Marab. I don't know how much I buy that. If you can't train, why are you in the fight? Fighters are delusional enough to believe that they will be all right going into a fight badly injured. If you can't train, how are you going to fight? I mean, it goes back to the Musashi Miyamoto quote. You can only fight the way you practice. And that is a very true statement. Without the practice, you are not going to fight well. That's why I don't understand from some of these fighters. Guys like him, guys like T.J. Dillashaw, if you are so damaged, if you're so injured that you can't even train properly, why are you in the fight? pull out of the fight and come back for it later because now you're coming off a loss and now you're in a worse position that you thought you could ever be on your return right TJ Dillashaw could have came back later and got his title shot instead of taking up the title fight with one arm Henry Cejudo if he did have issues with injuries in the training camp he wouldn't be in this situation where he needs several wins to get back to a title shot but the call out of Brennan Moreno is a pretty smart move it's a fight that a lot of people would like to see and he wants to do it at UFC 306 at the Sphere, which makes sense. And wanting to fight in what will be enemy territory too. 
that place is going to be jam-packed with people from Mexico. And we know a lot of them just don't like Henry Cejudo. Did he denounce his Mexican heritage or something? As I saw some people tell me, like, the reason why the Mexican fan base doesn't like Henry Cejudo is because he's kind of turned his back on them. And he had this whole rivalry with Brendan Moreno, who is the biggest Mexican fighter on the roster. But we'll see if it's an off night for Brendan Moreno in terms of, like, him being washed. You know, we'll see how he competes against someone like Henry Cejudo if they do that fight. Did you guys see uh, Eugene Behrman? So Eugene Behrman wants Volk to fight Tapuria again this year. Now, Behrman is not Volk's head coach. I think Joe Lopez did say that he wants Volk to wait out, not fight too soon. But they are all expecting him to probably fight this year against Tapuria again. And Tapuria is saying that he's going to probably fight in October or November. So that might be the next fight for Tapuria is the rematch of Volkanovski. And I don't even think that's enough time for him to properly recover from these knockout losses. And considering his age too, you know, we might see Volk fight again this year. And that's going to be concerning as a Volk fan. His coaches might run him into the ground. We know fighters are complying to their coaches. Even if Volk has doubts of his return, which I don't think he really does, the coaches will reel him in to fight again. Right? And he should be taking this whole year off. Maybe they can get into his head and say, you know, he got lucky. You can beat him next time. Just fight this year. It's enough time for you to cover all that stuff. That's not enough time. Right. And this guy also comes from rugby where the recovery after getting concussed is nowhere near as long as in MMA. Right. Those guys come back probably next month after getting knocked out. And that might be what he's used to. And from one fighter under Eugene Behrman to another. So Adesanya was supposed to headline UFC 300 against Drick is Duplessis, but Drick is didn't accept it. And it's most likely because of the damages against Sean. Strickland. I know Drickus did say in the post fight press conference that he would like to come back in April and fight at UFC 300, but maybe after this time, almost a month and a half it's been, he probably doesn't feel ready to go and fight in April. And it's very interesting how every time they're trying to have him fight Adesanya, it would be him compromised. The first time he had an injury, and then Adesanya and Eugene Behrman were talking trash about Drickus not stepping up when he needs to, but who's to dictate when he needs to step up? He's the champion right now, so he clearly made the better move. And then it happened again for 300. They want him to fight Adesanya after he got banged up in that Strickland fight. But now Adesanya is saying he kind of understands why he probably isn't taking it. Now, the big thing to take away from this is they might go with this fight regardless if it's at 300 or later, right? They might have these two fight each other in a later date whenever Drick is, is ready. So if Drick is not ready in April, he might be ready in June or July. And we might see Drickus versus Adesanya in the summer. That fight can go either way. I could see Adesanya beating him in the beating him on the stand-up. And I could see Drickus also taking him to the ground and submitting him. Should be a pretty good fight if it does happen. But I just don't think Adesanya deserves a title shot in terms of merit, right? It should either be I think Strickland or Kenanier, which is kind of weird because no other middleweight deserves it. Like the most deserving title contender is either coming off a loss to the champion with a couple wins before that, or a guy who's coming off one win against another top contender. Middleweight is just in a very weird place, man. And not only this weight class, also featherweight is, it's not as great as it used to be. Like if we look at every single weight class in terms of the best era they've ever had, like you look at middleweight for an example, it was way back when Wyman and Rockhold were champions or in the beginning of the Whitaker era. That was when middleweight was by far the best it's ever been throughout its entire history. The only era that probably comes close is the Adesanya era. Every other era just doesn't really come close to that. Even today's era doesn't come close. Anderson's era for sure doesn't come close. The Franklin era for sure doesn't come close either. I mean, look who you had back in those days in the middleweight division. You had Chris Wyman, Anderson Silva, Vitor Belfort, Luke Rockhold, Jacare Souza, Leota Machida, Yoel Romero, Robert Whitaker, Michael Bisping, Gegard Mousasi. I mean, the middleweight division when Wyman and Rockhold were champions was 10 times what it is today. You look at the featherweight division, the best featherweight ever was was like late Aldo era or when Conor beat him. That was the best featherweight division ever. When you had Frankie Edgar, Max Holloway, Chad Mendes, Ricardo Lamas, Cub Swanson, Charles Oliveira, Dustin Poirier. I mean, featherweight was at a whole different level back then compared to what it is now. Right now, you have Ilya Tapuria, Alexander Volkanovsky, and Max Holloway, which are the elite of the elite. These are some of the best featherweights you can ever have. But then it falls off. It falls off to Yair Rodriguez and Brian Ortega. And maybe Mavsar Evloev and, Ar and Arnold Allen. Then it drops off even further to Josh Emmett. Kelvin Cater, Giga Shikadze, Bryce Mitchell, like featherweight is clearly not what it used to be, even though it has those top three guys. Those top three are some of the best fighters pound for pound in the UFC right now. All three of them. The only two weight classes that are generally elite when you look at just everybody are bantamweight and lightweight. Welterweight's decent. It's not bad. Flyweight's also decent, I would say. 
But then all the other weight classes are just not it, man. Even the strawweight division, which is the best female division, has greatly declined from the Ioana and Rose days. The premier weight classes in the UFC are bantamweight and lightweight. And this kind of stuff happens, you know? There's always a transition period throughout its time. And I think it's going to also blend into the whole, like, money stuff, like the business side of the game. I think the fighters are starting to wake up and understand their worth after Cejudo's blunder and looking at guys like Sean O'Malley, who was not willing to take up contender fights without getting paid for it. You're looking at Ilya Teporia knowing that he's going to retire in like five years. Islam Makashev kind of similar as well. These fighters are starting to understand their worth. Like Paddy Pimble is getting paid millions of dollars and he's not even a champion, not even close to it. He's making more money outside the octagon than even some of the champions in the UFC. He just knows how to play his cards. And the fighters are only going to get smarter in terms of making more money, which is a great thing for them, man. Yo, and do you guys see this fight week? We got some insane fights coming up Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So on Thursday, we got Cedric Dumbe, for me, the most exciting fighter outside the UFC, going up against Baki. Yeah, they call him Baki, and I don't know if it's because of the anime. And the PFL is putting two of their top talents to the test this early in their careers. Baki is PFL's prospect. Like, this is the guy they want to mature and grow up in their organization so they can make a name out of him, right? He's only 22 years old. He's 5'10", 7-0 professionally. He's a well-rounded fighter with boxing and wrestling. Excellent feints, a really good lunging left hook, good takedowns, big and strong guy, and he's definitely going to go the wrestling route against Cedric Dumbe. And Dumbe, as we know, is one of the better strikers in MMA right now and can be PFL's biggest superstar. I mean, the guy is enormous in France. If any of you guys who are from France, let me know how big of a deal this guy is over there because I'm seeing some huge social media engagement with this guy. So it's really hard for me to tell how big he actually is. But that's going to be on Thursday. Exciting fight. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm definitely going to cover that one when it's done. And then on Friday, we got the boxing fight between Anthony Joshua and Francis Ngannou. My most anticipated boxing fight right now as Nganu is a part of it. I hope he does well. I hope he wins. It's going to be a dangerous fight because Anthony Joshua is not going to take him lightly. If there is any truth to Tyson Fury overlooking Nganu, Joshua is not going to have that. Right? Joshua is going to take this guy extremely seriously. It's pretty much going to be technique versus power, even though both guys have a bit of both. Right? Joshua is going to be the more technical boxer, but he definitely has a lot of power too. And Ganu is definitely going to have the power advantage, but he is a lot more technical than boxing fans originally thought. And I don't think Joshua has the chin to take some big shots from Ngannou. He could probably take one or two, but definitely not consistently. I don't think anybody has the chin to take Ngannou's punches like that. And then on Saturday, we got UFC 299, one of the most stacked cards in the past like five years or so. We got the rematch of Sean O'Malley versus Cheeto. Going to be pretty interesting how that goes down, but it looks like uh, a bit of the steam got taken out of that fight because of how dominant Marab Davalashvili is. And also, a lot of people are very high on Umar Nurmagomedov. Even after his performance against Bexat, Cheeto might be able to do some things. It just depends on how much pressure and volume he puts forward on O'Malley. I think if he puts a lot more volume, Cheeto's going to have a lot of success against O'Malley and might even win the fight. But my prediction video is going to come up tomorrow or Wednesday, so be on the lookout for that. I'll definitely have my pick by then, but breakdowns are more important than the actual pick itself. The co-main event, Dustin Poirier, the legend, going up against one of the special forces of France, Benoit Saint-Denis. He's like the new Crow Cop in, in that sort of sense, where he has like that real soldier warrior background, and you definitely see it when he fights, man. Even though Dustin is the more skilled and technical fighter, Benoit's seen some things, man. And there is no quit in this guy at all. We know Dustin likes to pour it on his opponents, but Benoit is going to be there the whole time, man. He's a big, strong, powerful guy. And he can improvise catching anybody in the world, man. So it's going to be really, really interesting how that goes down. Kevin Holland, Michael Page, can't wait to see that. Michael Page's UFC debut has been something I've been waiting for ever since his second professional fight. I've known this guy. I've been waiting to see that move, and finally it happens. And a great opponent, honestly. Kevin Holland has the perfect style to put on a show with Michael Page. Gilbert Burns, Jack Della Malalena is going to be interesting. Peter Yan and Song Yudong. There's a lot of fans I'm seeing right now that are riding the Song Yudong train, right? They think he's going to be a little too much for even Peter Yan. But I don't know, Peter Yan may have corrected some of those weaknesses and comes out a whole different beast. Curtis Blaze versus Jelton Almeida is great. Matush Gamma versus RDA. Pedro Munoz versus Kyler Phillips is pretty good. And I cannot wait to see Rebellus Despain. 
Poor Josh Parisian, man. He is the guy that has to welcome this monster into the UFC. I hope they're paying him extra on the back for this. And with that, let's go right to the questions. We're going to start with Sam Wise Gamgi. Hey, Weasel, thanks for the consistency, man. With UFC Mexico and CDMXPI a done deal, please give us your thoughts on a Patty the Batty versus Manuel El Loco Torres matchup. Also, how do you see Daniel Zellhuber doing against the bottom contenders at 155? Saludos from Baja. Thank you so much, man. And shout out to Mexico. So, Patty versus Torres? I think Torres destroys him in the stand-up. I think he's way too powerful. Patty's dangerous on the ground. He does have really good Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but I don't see how he finds a way down there. Torres is a big, strong 155-er, and the amount of power that he has is just way too much for Patty, I think. Patty has a decent chin. He will take some shots, but I think eventually it would be a TKO win for Torres. And as for Daniel Zalhuber, going up against the lower end of the top 15, Man, this guy's reach is going to be an issue. I think he beats Drew Dober. I think Dober can give him some issues if he finds his way on the inside. But then again, he did a really good job of not allowing Prado to get much success when he got there. So I think he would keep Dober at a distance, intercepting him with some good open stance kicks, and keeping a good right straight on him. I think he TKO's Bobby Green. It looks like Green has a very hard time at finding his range against taller and longer guys, which was shown in the Jalen Turner fight. Jalen Turner wasn't really giving him crazy footwork or angles and stuff, and he wasn't able to find his range. He couldn't get in. And I think the same thing would be with Zell Huber, who's a little bit trickier with his defense. So I would definitely go with Zell Huber. Hinato Moicano. If he can avoid the ground game, I think he should be able to just outrange Moicano with everything. But that would be a very, very tough fight. If Moicano can get it to the ground, Zell Huber will be in some trouble. If he can clinch up with him, body lock, trip him, get on top. I think Moicano could win, but if I had to pick one or the other, I'd probably lean towards Moicano. Benoit St. Denis. I think Benoit is a little too powerful, and he has a really good chin, so he will get hit a lot, and I think Zahuber will be winning the fight until Benoit starts landing. As soon as Benoit starts landing his punches and kicks, I think it becomes like an avalanche, right? The snowball becomes an avalanche, and eventually Zahuber will go down. And then finally, RDA, I'm going to go with Zahuber. Again, too long. I think he'll keep a really good jab on RDA. Number one, how good of a year would this be for O'Malley, even though it's unlikely to go this way? So UFC 299, he beats Cheeto by decision. 249-46, 140-47. Yeah, I actually see that happening. And then UFC 302 or 303, he beats Marab by second round knockout. And then at UFC 309 in December, he beats Sanhagen by decision. Oh, that year would be insane. I mean, nobody would think he would be able to do that. Well, actually, I think if he were to knock out Marab, he would be the favorite going into the San Hagen fight. Just off of the fact that he does that to Marab, you know? Even though I do think that San Hagen might be his most difficult fight overall because San Hagen can hang with him on the stand-up and he could potentially beat him on the ground. And a lot of these fighters don't have both qualities, you know? San Hagen is like one of the few that does. It'd be an insane year for Sean O'Malley and that would propel him to become a much bigger star. And then number two... Even though people consider Volk the featherweight GOAT, who do you think is higher on the GOAT list overall, Aldo or Volk? Also, do you think Volk having the career resurgence Aldo had at bantamweight, or are you not so optimistic? I'm not as optimistic because what Aldo was able to do, rejuvenate his career to that extent, was something nobody thought would happen. Nobody expected Aldo to look as good as he did, which might come off as an anomaly, like just a thing that we're not going to see for other fighters. And Volkanovski is older than Aldo was, I believe. Volkanovski is 35, and he's coming off two horrible knockout losses, and it looks like he's going to continue his career at 145. I don't know what he would do. Would he go up to 155? Because I can't see Volkanovski going down, right? Aldo was small enough where he could go down and be the bigger man against those 135ers, whereas Volkanovski, the only place he can move is up to 155, and that is going to be even worse for his health. Those guys are much more dangerous than the 145ers. And he probably would get knocked out again, especially if he fights someone like Gates Chi or maybe Oliveira or maybe Dustin Poirier. You know, these guys just hit so much harder. So I'm not as optimistic. But in terms of who's higher on the GOAT list, Aldo or Volk, it's Aldo because Aldo did have some good wins at 135. If you just look at their 145 records, I think they're somewhere around the same level in terms of GOAT status. But when you're counting their overall careers... We have to also factor in what Aldo did at 135. He has that win over Cheeto. Arguably beat Marlon Moraes in his prime. He beat Pedro Munoz and Rob Font. And even though he lost to Marab, he did do better against him than some of these other guys are. I mean, look what Marab just did to Cejudo. He couldn't do something like that to Jose Aldo. Even though Aldo was past his prime. So therefore, yes, in terms of like the GOAT list, overall Aldo is above Volkanovski. But I would say both fighters are arguably top five, if not top 10. And then number three, any robbery decisions where you were legitimately confused about what a judge even saw in the round 
to give it to the wrong fighter. Not one where it's even a tiny bit understandable why a judge would give the wrong guy the round, but one where you just don't know what the judge saw to give it to the guy. Oh yeah, there's been so many. Like uh, what just happened with Brennan Moreno and Brennan Royval. How did that one judge give it 49 to 46 to Moreno? Like maybe I can understand a little bit of how you give Moreno 48, 47, even though I don't agree with that. 49, 46 to Moreno is insanity. One of the worst of all was Patty Pimblett and Jared Gordon. Jared Gordon absolutely won that fight. He probably even won the fight 30-27, let alone losing 29-28. Or what about that one scorecard where the judge gave the fifth round a 10-8 for Grasso against Shevchenko? That was a horrible scorecard. Or a judge gave in the fourth round to Josh Emmett against Kelvin Cater when were the only arguable rounds you could give him are 1, 2, and 3. Arguably. Or Chaos Williams versus Rolando Bedoya where... They gave the second round to Chaos Williams, even though his leg was buckling from those kicks. And then we go to Mike. Number one, during GSP's championship reign, was the nickname Rush the opposite of how GSP actually fought? Also, if GSP fought with a Rush style during his championship reign, do you think he would have been dethroned? And if yes, who do you think would have beaten him? Yeah, so GSP fought a lot differently before he lost to Matt Serra. He was way more aggressive and willing to stand up with his opponents. He had a lot of good knockouts during that time. Rush is probably not like the best nickname for him because even back then he was pretty cerebral. It wasn't super aggressive. He wasn't rushing like Vanderlei Silva, but he was a bit more aggressive back then. Now, during his long championship reign, if he fought with that sort of style, yeah, he would have lost eventually, I think. He put himself into the fire a little bit too much. He would have gotten caught by some big strikes eventually, and he didn't have the same sort of wrestling style, so the second fight with BJ Penn would have been very difficult for him. I think he would have lost to Johnny Hendricks. The Carl's Condit fight would have been more difficult. And then your second question, even if this sounds like it's from a fantasy book, if Volkanovski rematches Ortega and gets caught in the same guillotine as their first fight, with the exact same setup of Ortega grabbing his leg and getting him in the mounted guillotine, and this time, instead of getting out of it, Volk taps. How sad would that be for you and most of the fans? Thanks, Weasel. Um, yeah, that would have been sad, but it's part of the fight game, you know? It's like they say, this game is all about inches, man. One small mistake and the fight is over for you. And that could be against anybody at this level, right? We're very used to just seeing UFC fighters and comparing them to each other so like the differences seem to be very vast when in reality when we scope out these guys are not all differently matched with each other right most of these guys especially in the top 15 top 10 they can all beat each other most of these guys can beat each other one small zig when you should have zagged and everything changes you know what i'm saying so if ortega were to tap him out with the same guillotine maybe he adjusts his grip a little bit but if you're saying everything's the exact same that would just show that volkanovsky got worse that's what it would show because ortega is doing the same exact thing he didn't fix or get better at anything in your scenario it's only volkanovsky tapped out instead but then we go to Troy Hartung. What do you think would have happened next for Michael Johnson if he had finished Justin Gaethje when they fought back in the summer of 2017? I have my own idea on what could have happened, which I'll break down into some steps in a moment, but I'm curious on your take. It looked like the Justin vs. MJ fight could have been stopped twice, both in the favor of MJ, in the last 30 seconds of the first round and in the beginning of the second round when Justin was on rubber legs. What could have happened for Michael Johnson so he would not have went down to 145 after? And maybe he would get a fight with Eddie Alvarez? because Gaethje got that fight after. Or he could have fought RDA. I think that could have been another fight, potentially against Nate Diaz earlier. Now, this is what you think. You say Michael Johnson would have fought Tony Ferguson in a rematch for the interim lightweight belt in 2017 instead of it being Kevin Lee getting that opportunity. Yeah, that would have been pretty interesting. How would you have seen the rematch going down considering MJ made Tony Ferguson look pretty easy to beat back in the day? I personally think MJ would have finished Tony this time, considering Tony usually had a bad habit of lifting his chin when he would strike even during his prime. Yeah, but you have to also remember that Tony, I think, had his arm broken from a kick when he fought Michael Johnson. Tony could be in trouble, similar how he could be in trouble with a lot of other strikers, the fact that he does lift his chin up and stuff like that, but the pressure he would put on Michael Johnson would be kind of problematic after the first aggressive step in, you know? So if Tony Ferguson steps in with the jab and stuff, he could get countered by Michael Johnson's left hand. But if he were able to avoid it in some very awkward, unorthodox way, like Tony sometimes will be able to do, then MJ would be in a lot of trouble and close because of Tony's elbows, because of all that pressure, and he'd be staying in Michael Johnson's face, and, and MJ could eventually crumble to the pressure. Kind of similar to what happened with uh, the Justin Gaethje fight, where eventually he succumbed to it. But yeah, hypothetically, I could even see MJ catching him. I don't think he would ever finish Tony, though. Tony in his prime was so hard to finish. I mean, look what Justin Gaethje had to do against a Tony Ferguson who cut weight twice going into the fight in order to get a finish. I mean, 
the amount of punches he landed throughout five rounds, I don't think would be replicated from Michael Johnson. I personally think Tony would have beaten MJ, but I wouldn't be surprised if MJ beat him either. And then number two, if MJ won against Tony again, that probably means the only option the UFC could have done for the 155 pound belt would have been Conor McGregor versus Michael Johnson. If that happened in 2018, how would you have seen that matchup going down? I have a sneaky feeling MJ would have KO'd Conor because of how ridiculously fast and powerful Prime MJ was with his boxing, and Conor was never known to pace himself too well over a long fight. I don't think Al boxes Conor. Now, 2018 Conor, after the Floyd Mayweather fight and a bit of a hiatus, maybe he could find some good shots on that version of Conor, but I still don't think he outboxes him. I think Conor would beat Michael Johnson. So Michael Johnson could have an effective jab, and that was shown in the Nate Diaz fight. Whenever Conor goes up against these southpaw boxers, he definitely has an issue with the jab. This was shown in the Dustin Poirier fight as well. Michael Johnson would be throwing that jab, but he does drop it very often. His jab necessarily isn't that powerful. It's his left hand and right hook that usually have that sort of power, whereas Conor McGregor, I think, would be able to time the jabs after Michael Johnson constantly spams those. He's not too versatile with his boxing. He throws a few different efficient punches, and I think Conor would be able to read those and counter Michael Johnson with the left hand, eventually putting him down. And Conor also has a pretty interesting forward and bouncing motion that would make it even difficult for Michael Johnson to hit him sometimes, right? He might overextend with the left hand if he thinks Conor is going to come in because Conor had a really good ability to kind of create an illusion in front of you to draw out your power hand. And that would even come from the power of left hand from Johnson. And I think eventually Connor would counter him at some point and put him on the ground. But if Michael Johnson were to pull that off, I mean, that'd be crazy, right? And then number three, I could also see Connor stopping MJ too, but the winner regardless would have likely gotten mauled by Habib in the end of 2018. But my conclusion to all this is I don't think it's too far-fetched thinking Michael Johnson wasn't too far off from getting a title shot had he won over Justin Gaethje. And yeah, I agree with you. If he beat Justin Gaethje, he was probably two or three wins away from a title shot. But here's the thing though. How many people would have thought that would be a big win for Michael Johnson if he beat Justin Gaethje like that? Because remember, when he got Justin Gaethje hurt at the end of the first round, he wasn't in that much trouble before. It would not be the fight that we remembered. It wouldn't be the fight where Justin Gaethje was coming back and wailing on him, you know? It would have looked like Michael Johnson was just a better fighter, and we know a lot of fans would have thought that Justin Gaethje was just not that good. He was overhyped from the World Series of Fighting. Those guys are not UFC caliber. That might have been a huge narrative coming out of the fight if Michael Johnson beat him. But regardless, Michael Johnson would be in a position to get a couple more wins to fight for a belt. He's very underrated, though. Then we're the Nano Peach. Hey, Weasel, my questions are, what are Volk's chances against Ilya if Volk fights him early next year or in November? With Pantoja having a win against most current flyweights, who do you think might beat him? And do you see him getting KO'd since he gets into wars like every two fights? Again, much love from the North Pole. Thank you so much, man, and shout out to you. What are Volk's chances against Ilya if Volk fights him early next year or in November? I think uh, Ilya beats him even worse. I think Volk's time is done as a champion, as sad as that is. Um, it's just the natural order of the game. The younger guys beat out the older fighters, take their spots, and the older fighters decline. That's what usually happens. And Volk is 35 years old. He's been knocked out twice. He had an insane career. And honestly, it feels like it went by so quickly. Like, he had so many good fights. He was an active champion, mostly, compared to the average champ. So it does seem like it went by pretty quickly. But what he was able to do was extraordinary. At the end of the day, though... I think he gets knocked out by Ilya again, and probably in an easier fight for Ilya. And then as for Pantoja, who would be the guy that beats him? If there's anybody that beats him, it's probably a young fighter like Mohamed Mokayev or Tatsuro Taira, someone like that. He's already beaten so many of the ranked flyweights. I mean, get this. Look at Alexander Pantoja's record against the top 15 is like 9-0 right now. He beat Brandon Royval twice, Brandon Moreno three times, Kai Kara France once, Manel Kep once, Alex Perez once, and Matt Schnell once. That is crazy, man. He has beaten more top 15 fighters than most champions in history. You have to look at John Jones, GSP, Anderson Silva, Demetrius Johnson, and Jose Aldo as probably the only fighters that have beaten more top 15 guys than Alexander Pantoja. So I think it has to be some young guy. Tatsuro Tyra in the future might be the guy to do it, or Mohamed Mokayev. Now, regards to him going through these wars, yeah, it's a scary thing for Pantoja, man. He's gotten hit so many times, and especially from that David Zafigueredo fight back in the day, he took so much damage in that fight. In fact, that's in fact that's the only time Pantoja ever got knocked down in a fight was against Figgy. But it's been a lot of damage he's taken in his career. He has to be careful because he could be another fighter that declines due to head trauma. And eventually, do I see him getting KO'd? I have a feeling, yeah, he probably does get KO'd. I mean, he doesn't have like great striking defense and he does use his chin a lot of times in order to absorb damage and get his way on the inside. 
And then with the King Louis, could you do a breakdown of a potential matchup between Strickland and Whitaker? Yeah, I kind of did it like two videos ago, but I think that Strickland and Whitaker is actually a very good fight. It's interesting because if we thought about this fight back in like 2019 or 2020, nobody would ever think Strickland even had a chance against Whitaker. But the game evolves and styles make fights. I think Strickland's jab would give Whitaker a lot of problems. It would keep him at bay. It would stop him from blitzing in from range. It's a good intercepting tool for him. And we saw what Paulo Coles was able to do with the jab against Whitaker. Strickland has a much better jab. Even though they throw it in a different manner, Strickland doesn't step in the way Paulo Costa does, but has a lot less telegraph and a lot trickier to defend against. And I think Whitaker, due to his style of blitzing in the way he does, I think that jab would be very disruptive against him. And from distance, I think Strickland would be able to line up the one-two. Like I mentioned before, Whitaker's exits are a big defensive hole of his. And if Strickland does commit with counter punches, he should be able to line up the right hook or the left hook, depending on which angle Whitaker exits out from. Strickland would be able to line that up. And we saw from the Romero fights that Romero was able to catch him with the right hook as Whitaker was exiting off his own left. Now, Strickland doesn't have the same kind of power, so I don't expect him to knock out Whitaker with a shot like that, but he could rack up damage due to it. Now, Whitaker might be willing to shoot for takedowns and stuff, but Strickland has good takedown defense and a much better ability to get up once he gets taken to the ground. The kicks could be an issue, but Strickland's getting better with checking those. The head kick's going to be harder to land on someone like Strickland due to how tall he stands and how high his guard is. When you really start to think about it, stylistically, this fight is a lot more problematic for Whitaker than people are led to believe. Defensively, Strickland should be able to block and evade most of the shots that Whitaker throws at him. And Strickland should be able to counter him if he commits for them. Because we know against Drickus, he didn't commit with as many counter strikes as he should have. So I do think at the end of the day, I think it's technical more than exciting. I don't think there's going to be a lot of damage in the fight. I think it becomes like a chess match in terms of who's going to find the opening on who and rack up on points, you know? It really could go either way. I think Strickland probably wins, probably, given that Whitaker has declined a little bit in his skill set, and Strickland is only getting better, but it's really hard to predict. I hope they do make this fight, though, if they're going to do Adesanya versus Drickus. They're going to AAG. How does Ortega do against Ilya realistically? Love the vids. Thank you so much, man. How does Ortega do against Ilya Tapuria? Oh, man. Volkanovski and Max Holloway were not able to knock him out. I think Tapuri would put him down. Now, knowing that Yair dropped him pretty easily in that first round, it looks like Ortega's chin has declined a little bit. I think Tapuri would be able to follow up on those with precise punches rather than what Yair was doing, telegraphing his kicks and stuff like that. Wasn't really able to find the openings well after he hurt him. The problem against someone like Ilya when he hurts you is that you really have nowhere to go, right? If you want to stay from range, you're so concussed to a point where you can't really dictate range that well. So usually what fighters tend to do when they're hurt is to tie up with you or get in close. That's not where you want to be against Ilya. So he goes down as being one of the scariest fighters when you're hurt. When he's on the hunt as you're hurt, you have very little chances of getting out of it. You just got to knock him out. You got to get offensive. Right, You can't be defensive against Ilya Tapuria when you're hurt. And Ortega might be able to find some crazy shot like an upward elbow, uppercut, something crazy like that. But I think Ilya Tapuria will put him down. Now, Ortega can't take him down. The takedowns he got on Yair Rodriguez would never work against Tapuria. So Ortega will be stuck in the stand-up trying to land some crazy, unorthodox, unpredictable strike that Tapuria just does not see. And I don't think that happens. Ortega doesn't move his head that well. I think Ely would faint his way on the inside and crack him with a right overhand, hurting him. Push him up against the fence, pressure him, and then hit him with some good body shots that might put him down from there. Or follow up with the overhand again that knocks Ortega out. I think Ilya Tapuria would eventually knock out Ortega. The guy just doesn't have any defense. He leaves his face open to get hit. Sometimes he will literally walk into punches, and I think Tapuria would put him down with a really good shot. Then with the DXN, who wins the most improved fighter award in every weight class? Thank you for the great content, brother. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, man. The most improved fighter award in every weight class. I'm guessing you're saying like from last year or just in general. I don't know if you're saying from last year or just in general. So I'm going to look at the current fighters and just see how much improved they have gotten. So for an example, in the heavyweight division, I think the most improved fighter... I would say it's probably Curtis Blades or Alexander Volkov. It's one of the two. I think um, Curtis Blades has definitely evolved his strike into a level that has to be somewhat respected and has become much more well-rounded now. So it definitely has to be credited in a division where most fighters do not really progress or get better. Um, Curtis Blades is one of the few fighters that did get better. But the thing is, as his striking has gotten better, 
his fight IQ has declined because he believes he's some sort of striker now, and that leads him to get caught. The other fighter is Alexander Volkov, where his fight IQ has not declined. So in the beginning, he had a pretty good run, like a three-fight win streak or something in the UFC. Then he started to lose and win, lose and win. You know, get a couple wins here, then lose again. And his biggest hole seemed to have been his takedown defense. Now, it's not a great fighter to scale off of, but technically against Alexander Romanov, who is mostly a wrestler, Volkov did defend all of his takedowns. Now, he looked like he had the incorrect fusion dance, right? He became the fat version of himself. Didn't look physically ready for the fight. It's hard to really scale off of that when you look at guys like Tom Aspinall and Curtis Blades, you know what I'm saying? But it looks like Alexander Romanov, not only in his grappling, but even his striking is looking better these days. He's getting good knockouts. Like his knockout against Rosenstrike and Romanov were really good to see. And then schooling Taito Ivasa the way he did. It looks like Volkov may be the most improved fighter in the heavyweight division. And then for light heavyweight, if we're going all time in their careers, it's Jan Blachowicz. Because in the beginning, Jan Blachowicz was not that good. In fact, there was a point in his career where it looked like he was going to get cut from the UFC. Yeah, in the beginning of his UFC career, he was 2-4. and four. He went 2-4 and four in the beginning. And if he had another loss after Patrick Cummins, I think he would have been cut from the UFC. And then looking at what he did right after losing to Patrick Cummins where he beat guys like Jared Kananir, Jimmy Madwa, Nikita Krylov. He had a weird TKO loss at Thiago Santos, where he rushed out of nowhere and got knocked out for it. The fight was kind of competitive up to that point. But then after that, you know, knocking out Luke Rockhold, beating Jacques Ray Souza, knocking out Corey Anderson, Dominic Reyes, beating Israel Adesanya. For the fans that stopped watching the sport at April of 2017, they would never have thought that Jan Blachowicz would ever make it to the level he got to. So I would say for the light heavyweight division, it's absolutely Jan Blachowicz. His understanding of striking got a lot better. His takedown defense got a bit better, not too much better. In the back, back in those days, he was going to take it down a little too easily. And his understanding of the game just got better over time, which is crazy because it happened at such an older age for him. And then for the middleweight division, the most improved fighter, it's probably Sean Strickland. I mean, even a few years ago. People were laughing at Strickland as a potential title contender. Nobody ever thought that he would even make it there, especially after losing to Alex Pereira. It's like, oh yeah, there's no way Strickland ever fights for a belt in his entire career. And then he eventually beats Adesanya and has a very close fight with Drikas. After beating the likes of Abels Magomedov, the Nazardine Imovov win is looking better now. The Brandon Allen win is looking insanely good right now. But then he had like a close fight with Jack Hermanson. You know, he had wins against Christoph Jocko and Uriah Hall and Jack Marshman. Like these aren't the caliber of wins that would make you think this guy's going to fight for a belt one day, you know? And he wasn't even knocking these guys out or something like that either. Now he's one of the best middleweights on the planet. So Sean Strickland is definitely the most improved middleweight. He had the worst leg kick defense in the sport, and they just fixed it easily. And then in the welterweight division, the most improved fighter has to be Bilal Muhammad. You have to give credit where it's due. Some people might say, what about Gilbert Burns? Well, Gilbert Burns never really had a bad career at welterweight. He had some losses at lightweight, but if we're only talking about welterweight, I mean, Bilal Muhammad had some bad losses there. You know, the way he lost to Jeff Neal, the way he lost to Vicente Luque. He even lost to Ellen Joban. You know what I'm saying? After the Jeff Neal loss, he had a really good streak going on. And he eventually did beat Gilbert Burns. So I do think Bilal Muhammad is the most improved welterweight. Like, his whole game has gotten better. His wrestling looks a lot stronger. And he's more technical with it as well, especially when he gets on the ground on top of his opponent. He's way better at holding positions than he used to be. His fight IQ just in general has elevated as he's fought where that cannot be said for all the other welterweights. And then for the lightweight division, I guess you could say Charles Oliveira, but he didn't really look bad at 155 outside of the Paul Felder fight. If you count his featherweight career, then it's easily Charles Oliveira. If you're just counting lightweight, I guess you can say it's Justin Gaethje maybe, where he has not only gotten better as a fighter, he has changed his entire style, right? Dustin Poirier is also another good candidate as well for most improved fighters. So you got Charles, you got Dustin, and you got Justin. Justin Gaethje, again, changed his whole style. He's a lot heavier on distance management. He's a lot more composed under the fire in order to find openings for precise and technical shots compared to what he used to do before and just brawl with you. He's become such an intelligent fighter compared to what he used to be. And Dustin Poirier has kind of fine-tuned his entire game. He didn't really change his style too much. He just progressed everything he was already good at to another level. And then for the featherweight division, the most improved fighter, I would say it's Max Holloway. If you look at how he started in this weight class, he was losing to some guys that doesn't really make much sense, like Dennis Bermudez, and then he went on an incredible win streak. But he was so young when he lost back then. He was one of the youngest fighters on the roster. And then for the bantamweight division, the most improved fighter is easily Cheeto. So Marlon Vera always had some like weird losses on his record, like losing to Davy Grant back in the day. He lost to Douglas Silva de Andrade, who was a very underrated fighter, but still lost to him. 
He lost to John Lineker, who was pretty good for the time. He was quite dangerous, but he came up from 125. And then would have some wins here and there. There was a point in his career where he feared of getting cut from the UFC, and I think it was after the Douglas Silva de Andrade fight, or at least he needed to turn his career around and start to knock these guys out. He wasn't as dangerous earlier in his career like he is now. After that loss to Douglas Silva, he became a finisher. I mean, he literally finished his next five fights in the UFC after that loss before losing to Song Yudong and then beating Sean O'Malley. I mean, he became a completely different fighter after that. And then for the flyweight division, the most improved fighter is easily Brendan Moreno. This is a guy who got cut from the UFC. After he lost to Sergio Pettis and Alexander Pantoja, he got cut from the UFC, and he honestly didn't look great back then. This is a guy who lost in the Ultimate Fighter. He lost to Pantoja and Pettis, had one good win against Dustin Ortiz, and even his return fight against Askar Askarov was definitely a showcase that he got better. And then after that, he looked so much more impressive. He fought like two months later against Kai Kawa France, looked great in that fight, then beating Joseph Formiga, finishing Brandon Royvel, and then his title fight started to happen. And he is easily the most improved fighter in the flyweight division, by far. Look at the Pelco Guapo. How effective is tickling in a fight? Not that effective. I'm pretty sure you're not ticklish when you have adrenaline. And while you're going to tickle the fighter, you probably are going to give up some kind of limb or a position. Like, imagine you're going to tickle somebody. They grab your arm, they get their head under it, and put you into an arm triangle. So no, I don't think it's too effective. And then with the DEJ games, let's get the weasel to sing a song. Row, row, row your boat song. Fun fact, I was actually part of a choir once. Once only, though. It was uh, during middle school. My teacher told me I had a very unique voice. She used to uh, press the key. I don't know the keys on a piano, but it's like a really high one. I was able to hit every single key she pressed. And then she wanted to coach me and stuff after the school and stuff. It was really weird. So maybe in an alternate universe, I would have became a singer. But what genre would I sing? Well, these days, I really listen to anything now. I used to exclusively listen to rap. And uh, more conscious rap and underground rap. I used to listen to like Vinnie Paz a lot. I used to listen to Big L, Big Pun. Some old Andre 3000 stuff, some Eminem stuff. My favorite rapper ever, though, was DMX. And But now I kind of listen to anything, you know. If it sounds good, I'll listen to it. I've been listening to a lot of um some EDM and metal. They go to Kelvin. Who do you think would win these dream fights, both in their prime? Alex Pereira versus Alexander Gustafson. I'm going to go with Gustafson. Jose Aldo versus Ilya Tapuria. I would go with Ilya Tapuria, but that would be a very competitive fight. I know an argument against Tapuria would be that Jose Aldo fought Chad Mendez, and Mendez could not knock this guy out. But they don't throw punches the same way, and they don't have the same kind of precision. They don't engage on the inside the same way either. I think Tapuria would ultimately win, but I'm not opposed to Aldo getting the win either. I think it's very close. McGregor versus Volkanovski. I'll go with Volkanovski, but that's very tough. I could definitely see Connor countering him with the left hand. I mean, look at what Islam did. Remember when Volkanovski got countered by Islam's back step left? That's what Connor does to people. And I'm pretty sure Connor would be able to put Volk down with a shot like that. McGregor definitely has ways to win this fight, but I think more times out of 10, I would go with Volk. You all remember versus TRT Vitor. That, that's like impossible to know. They could literally knock each other out at any point. I think I'll go with Romero basically off the fact that he has a better chin than Vitor. Vitor is a better counter puncher. But Romero's so wild, it's hard to know what you're countering. And a Cuban missile might come out of nowhere and catch Vitor. Vitor's kind of plotting, you know, so he's not going to be moving too much. And Romero knows where to crash his body into. Cub Swanson versus TKZ. I'll go with Korean Zombie. TJ Dillashaw versus Sean O'Malley. I think I'll go with O'Malley, but that's a tough fight. Dillashaw in his prime was quite hard to hit at times. And he could find his way on the inside. He could wrestle with O'Malley in there. I think as long as Dillashaw stays in the pocket with O'Malley, he's going to be landing a lot of shots. And O'Malley's going to have a lot of trouble there. But I think at some point in the fight, O'Malley will catch him trying to take an angle. Jan Blahovich versus Rampage Jackson. I'm going to go with Blahovich. And Stipe versus Kane. I'm going to go with Stipe. Then we'll go to Jake's Whips. Putting weight classes aside, what are your dream UFC matchups stylistically? P.S. Absolutely love your videos. I don't miss a single one. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Putting weight classes aside, what are your dream UFC matchups? I usually answer these kind of questions for all time, so I'll use this question for current fighters. Fights I want to see right now. So I want to see Tapuria versus Holloway. I want to see John Jones versus Francis Ngannou, if Ngannou can come back. If not that fight, then Jones versus Aspinall. I would love to see Pereira versus Adesanya again. I mean, they could fight a million times, and I would not mind. I want to see Hamza Shemaev versus Shavkat Rachmanov, Connor versus Chandler, Islam versus Leon Edwards, eventually. Islam needs more title defenses before he gets that. I would also love to see Ilya Tapuri versus Rafael Vaziv. That would be a crazy fight. Sean O'Malley versus Corey Sanhagen. That would be an insane fight. Then we go to Mo Grimmie. 
what if the UFC kept Gegard? I think he would have eventually fought for the belt because he was on a, what, five-fight win streak? He beat Telus Laitis, Tiago Santos, Vitor Belfort, Uriah Hall, and then Chris Weidman. He could have fought Michael Bisping in the summer of 2017 for the undisputed title because in March, it was announced by Dana that Bisping was going to fight GSP. But then they said the fight got canceled. Right, because they wanted that fight during International Fight Week. But GSP was not ready for that, and he said he would be able to fight in November. So because the fight canceled, they had the interim title fight between Robert Whitaker and Yuval Romero, which showed that they're still looking to have the Michael Bisping and GSP fight later down the road. So instead of Robert Whitaker, it probably could have been Gegard Mousasi versus Yuval Romero. Because at that time, both Gegard and Romero had bigger wins than what Robert Whitaker had. Both Romero and Gegard were coming off a win over Chris Wyman, who was just the former champion. Whitaker's biggest win was against Jacare, so potentially Whitaker would have to fight one more time, and Musasi would have fought Yuval Romero instead. Now, who would have won between Gegard and Romero? I think Romero would have won, but Gegard would have at least had a chance to become the middleweight interim champion. And if he were to have beaten Romero, let's say hypothetically, he would have fought the winner of GSP, and Michael Bisping down the road, or at least he would have been promoted to the Undisputed Champion and would have had another fight before Adesanya fights him. And a fight between Adesanya and Gegar would have been very interesting because Gegar was extremely technical, very cerebral. He had a good ground game as well. One of the few guys in Adesanya's career that might be willing to take the fight to the ground and look for a submission at least, you know? Gegard leaving the UFC was a huge what-if because he was right there on cusp of a title shot and he left for Bellator. But again, I do think he would have lost to Romero. I think he would have lost to Whitaker and Adesanya, but none of those fights would have been easy for those guys. And he could have won some of those. Then we got to Adadar. Why is it so difficult for the UFC to create new superstars? So defining what a superstar is, in my perspective, I look at a superstar like a Conor McGregor or Brock Lesnar or Ronda Rousey or Habib, you know, guys who can sell like close to a million pay-per-view buys. So in terms of that, like fighters who can sell 800,000 buys, 900,000 buys, or a million, well, it comes down to many different factors. Number one, you got to find fighters that constantly win, can become a champion, have an interesting personality, or their fights are so incredibly exciting that fans just cannot miss it, like Anderson Silva, for an example. But in today's society, fans are really gravitating towards personality versus just fighting style and stuff, you know? A fighter needs the whole package, and the UFC cannot make them have that whole package. They got to find a fighter that has that and then they promote them and they have been some fighters that they missed the mark with like for an example look at the way that they were promoting ronda rousey back in the day like remember that trailer with her and holly home why don't they do more of that stuff you know the way that they got behind ronda rousey was completely different and i wish they did that more with other fighters because there are other fighters that are extremely interesting like even with alex Pereira, for an example now he doesn't speak english which does hinder his ability to sell a lot in the united states but they don't need him to speak they can at least create these like trailers and promos and promote him as like some monster in the ufc who's also quite funny behind the scenes and stuff they could promote yuri prohaska he's so interesting and fun Ilya tapuria right now should absolutely get a bunch of promotion behind him he's undefeated he's 27 years old real madrid has been posting about this guy they just had him in one of their games he's all over the media tour right now Ilya Tapuri should probably be the most promoted fighter in the UFC. There's too much opportunities. It's such a perfect fighter to promote. And he just defeated a legend in the sport. When he's uh, genuine, when he's not playing a character, he's a lot cooler than I would say someone like Sean O'Malley, for an example. You know, O'Malley's personality is a lot more laid back and he's kind of boring in a way. So it's really hard to promote his personality unless he's faking it. Whereas when Tapur is being himself, he seems like a really cool guy and stuff behind the scenes. Marab Davalashvili is a fighter they can promote a lot right now. He has one of the best personalities in the sport. He's an extremely dominant force in the bantamweight division. He can have a whole country behind him as well. And he seems to be that dominant force that could rule over this division for a long time. Promoting someone like that early is risky because anything can happen in this sport. He could lose. But... If there is anybody to promote, it is someone like Marab Devalishvili. So yeah, those are some of the difficulties of getting a new superstar. But most of it, I would say, is just the fighters themselves. They're with the Clay's coins. If Eljo beats Cater, would you rather see Eljo versus Volk or Eljo versus Ortega? I'd rather see Eljo versus Ortega. Because I think Volkanovski is too much for Eljo. I don't think Eljo would be able to take him to the ground. He would get outstruck completely. Eljo versus Ortega would be a pretty interesting fight. Ortega's the more dangerous striker of the two. But Eljo is smarter than Ortega. He has better defense overall. He has a better understanding of fighting in general. And they're both wizards on the ground. It'd be insane to see these two roll with each other. Look at the Mr. Kratos. How do you develop a deep understanding of fighting strategy? You have to understand how techniques work first. 
But once you understand how techniques work, also having experience in training will help you with this because you start to understand from sparring what works and what doesn't. Like what are the general strategies that most fighters use? Like for an example, opposite stance fighters generally like to get their lead foot on the outside of the opponents. Right, this lines up a lot of different things. It creates different properties between the two fighters. And then you kind of expand your knowledge off of that when you're watching fights and sparring with higher level guys and seeing what they're able to do as well. And then you kind of understand what specific fighters like to do and how that could kind of mesh with what the opponent's strengths and weaknesses are. So for an example, with Ilya Tapuri versus Alexander Volkanovsky, you look at their strengths and weaknesses, right? You look at Volkanovsky for an example, he's got a lot of strengths. Very, He's a good kicker, especially legs. He has a good understanding of boxing, especially from distance. He's hard to take to the ground. He has quick underhooks. He's physically strong in the clinch, but most of his striking game does revolve around distance management. He likes to faint a lot. Now, what are some of his weaknesses? Well, more specifically, where does he usually get into trouble in fights? It's usually when fighters get close to him, he gets hit the worst. So Islam Akashev, for an example, when he rushed Islam and got dropped in the first round momentarily, or when he tried to be aggressive and get on the inside and Islam backstepped with a left straight that rocked him, or Chad Mendez getting in his face and clocking him with a hook, or with Yair Rodriguez when he walked into that right straight. You tend to see a lot of weaknesses out of Volkanovski to be in close range like that when he's not able to dictate distance on you. And without being able to dictate distance, he has a lot less of an understanding of what the opponent is able to do. So then we look at Ilya Tapuria. What are his strengths? Well, pocket boxing. This is the way he beats most of his opponents. So when you look at his strengths, you got to look at where he's most effective. And that's in the opponent's face, punching them, right? He's good with the body shots. He's good with overhands. He has a really good ability to cut off the cage, even though there are times in his career where he will overextend with his punches and allow the opponent to get away. But generally speaking, when he's in close on you like that, he's going to hurt you. This will lead to my analysis, for an example, to see that if Tapuri gets into Volkanovski's face, he gets into the pocket, he will knock Volkanovski out. That's what led to my analysis there. He will knock Volkanovski out eventually, and Volk is going to have a harder time of getting out of that range because of Ilya Tapuri's cage-cutting ability as well. And I know the way that Volk likes to get out and exit away from the cage, as he's shown against Max Holloway, for an example, right? He's a lot of feints, lead hand feints, left hooks or left jabs in order to exit out behind the shoulder. But Tapuria understands, and he's not going to allow him to do so, knowing that his right overhand is one of his best weapons. Now, what are Tapuria's weaknesses? Range striking, right? That's a general big weakness of his, and checking leg kicks as well. So we know that Volk is going to have a lot more success with leg kicks, which he did have in the fight. Some of his biggest shots in the fight were the leg kicks. And from range, Volkanovski is going to have an advantage there. That's where he likes the fight as well. Now, I did not expect Volk to come out there with so many head kicks out of nowhere. I thought that was going to be more of like a secret card of his. You know, I'm going to do certain stuff in order to draw him into a head kick. Now, I'm going to spam head kicks in the beginning, and now I revealed my hand. Ilya Tapuri is not going to fall for this. But then you have to find ways of how Tapuri can get on the inside and find his success in the pocket. It's going to be off of those drop feints like I talked about, which he did use on Volk to find his entries on the inside. He could try to slip on the punches and enter behind those, which he did against Volkanovski's jab. The more jabs that Volk is going to throw, the more used to them Tapuria is going to be, which is going to allow him to slip on those jabs and find that entryway. So these are certain ways you could develop deep understanding of fighting strategy, and this goes for every single fighter. Every fighter has certain strengths and weaknesses, and you have to also try to put yourself in the fighter's shoes. This is something I like to do specifically. I like to put myself in the fighter's shoes, and if I was preparing for this guy, like, what is this guy known for? So if I was Tapuria, for an example, what does Volk do? Like, what do what do I think Tapuria understands about Volk? That's how his preparation is going to go into this fight, right? He wants to be at range. He does pump out a lot of jabs. He does faint a lot and stuff, and he will back up away from you. You know, these are the sort of things I expect Tapuria to understand about Volk, and then vice versa as well. Like, I know Tapuria's going to have a lot of success on the inside. I got to find ways to keep him out of there. Now, the way he tried to do that wasn't necessarily what I thought he was going to do, um, and it led eventually to his downfall, but this is sort of how it kind of goes. So off the top of my head, that's kind of like how I come to understand some fighting strategy and stuff. And then go to the next question. If Habib was a natural 170-er and fought Damian Maya in his prime, how would a fight between the two have gone? I guess my question is, how would Habib's ground game fare against Damian Maya's ground game? I think Habib beats Damian Maya. I think the ground upon would absolutely soften Damian Maya up. And I think Habib will be very strong on top to hold the positions, not allow Damian to sweep him. Dagestani wrestling style is just so different than what Damian Maya is used to. And that's ultimately the end of the episode, guys. Great questions, guys. And the next podcast is going to be up next week. We got some fights this Saturday, and I'll see you guys after those.